Good afternoon and welcome to the Greater St. Louis Business Aviation Association March webinar. I'm Tim Long, the immediate past president of Dieselball. Rich Rapp and Jeremy Cox, our president and vice president, are not available today, so you're stuck with me as your host. I'll make this as painless as possible. The presentation today is by Executive Jet Management. Before I introduce our panelists, a few quick reminders about some upcoming events. The Business Aviation Association Memorial Open will be held on Monday, May 24th at Old Hickory Golf Course. In St. Peter's, you can register to play on the Giza Ball website. If you know of anyone who would like to play, sponsor, and or donate a silent auction item, please share the information with them. The ninth annual Aviation Trivia Night is tentatively scheduled for early August. At this point, we don't know if we're going to be able to do a live event. If we are not, unable to do so, we will do a virtual trivia night. So stay tuned for more information on that in late spring. A few quick reminders about the charities we support, the Giza Ball Educational Foundation, uh, they have a website, it's www.gieselbaugh.echofoxtrot.org. Uh, you can go to that website and look for information uh, regarding scholarships that are available for students in aviation-related programs. And Wings of Hope has several events coming up. You can go to www.wingsofhope.ngo, click on Get Involved, and scroll down to Events. May 6th is Give St. Louis Day, STL Day, a 24-hour online giving event supporting multiple charities around St. Louis, including Wings of Hope. June 5th, we're going to have our 2021 Soaring to New Heights Summer Soiree. As some of you know, Wings of Hope held a black tie dinner auction gala for the past several years at the Ritz-Carlton in Clayton. This event has been a significant fundraiser for Wings of Hope. And with COVID, Wings of Hope is introducing the virtual Summer Soiree this year as a replacement to that event, which supports the Wings of Hope Medical Relief Air Transport Program. June 19th, we are going to be doing meal packing for Haiti, supporting Kids Against Hunger. There are 24 spots available for two-hour shifts. And then please save the date for a couple more events. Wings of Hope Plain Wash will be on July 17th. Taste of Hope will be September 25th. More information on those events will be coming uh, to the Wings of Hope website later this year. Now for our panelists from Executive Jet Management, I'm honored to introduce Mr. Patrick Deeker, Vice President of Managed Jet Sales, and Mr. Fred Calvert, Director of Safety Assurance. They will be presenting today on safety management systems. After the presentation, time will be available for Q&A. Please use the chat button on the bottom of the screen to submit questions to our panelists. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks so much, Tim. I appreciate it. Appreciate everybody who's joined and giving us a share of your afternoon. I'm not gonna spend too much time. I'm gonna put Fred, uh, here on the mic and let him walk through. We think we've got some really exciting information to share, a little peek behind the curtain in terms of how we execute our safety management systems and uh, look forward to uh, everybody getting a look at this and asking a bunch of questions and, and hopefully giving you something that you can take away with and, uh, and incorporate into your own operations. So with that, Fred, I'm gonna turn things over to you and let you uh, walk us through. All righty. Um... So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fred Calvert. I'm the Director of Safety Insurance here and an Air Safety Investigator at EJM. I've uh, been with uh, Executive Jeff for about 23 years. And uh, the presentation uh, that I'm going to do for you today is kind of a combination of stuff I uh, teach during our SMS in-doc. Uh, a couple slides from that, a presentation I did at the Flight Safety Foundation, um, Business Aviation Safety Summit in Denver a couple years ago, and a few slides from a presentation I did at the Massachusetts Business Aviation Association. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy it. Um, try, try not to get too much review, because I know all of you are probably familiar with SMS, but just a couple slides to kind of talk to you about how we approach SMS at EJM. And then some of the lessons that we've learned from the safety assurance side of uh, ASAP reporting, safety reporting, and also uh, flight data monitoring. So let me see if I can uh, make technology work here and I'll uh, get things set up and going. Let's see here. Who's there? And slideshow from the beginning. And share screen, and share sound. Okay, and screen one, and there we go. And uh, hopefully, everybody should be able to see my uh, screen here. 
And uh, I'll just, if someone can just uh, verify, Patrick. Yep, we can see the screen and uh, everything looks good. Very good. All righty. So um, let me get to the first slide, make technology. There we go. All righty. So this word safety. Um, I personally don't like the word safety. Uh, because it is, it's a good public word. It's a good word for the public because it makes them feel good. But what are we really doing? Um, good friend of mine, Ken Honiger at MITRE that helped write a lot of the SMS regulations, the 14 CFR Chapter 5, him and I always wish that they would have called it a risk management system because that's really what we're doing. We're managing the risk of literally taking a big hunk of metal through the air at 500 miles an hour, 37, 41, or 43,000 feet, wherever, wherever your airplane will go. And in, in reality, us as aviation professionals, we are really risk managers. Uh, but we had to use word safety because that's the, uh, the word the public likes and it makes them feel warm and fuzzy. But for us in the professional area, it really is about risk management. Um, quite frankly, anyone thinks there is not risk involved in flying an aircraft, um, please stay away from me uh, because it is. There is risk involved in that. And part of the mitigation of that risk is understanding that, yeah, there is risk. And quite frankly, embracing that fact and uh, then doing things to make sure that those risks don't outweigh our ability to take and safely navigate and uh, do what we're going to do, our mission with the aircraft. So um, this slide here is from my SMS presentation uh, that I do in NDOC. And I ask people, what is safety? Um, so the, the items in black that are here, the items in black are the official ICAO definition. Safety is the state at which risk is reduced to an acceptable level through a continuous process of hazard identification and risk management. Uh, for us at EJM, what I do is the stuff in TAN is how we approach it. So safety is a state in which risk is reduced at the departmental level. Um, I, as a safety manager, there's uh, three of us in the safety department. Um, we all have our expertise. Uh, Dennis Fox, our VP of safety, is a helicopter pilot, so he comes from a flight end. Uh, I am a private pilot, but I come from a safety investigation and maintenance end, so my, my expertise is in maintenance and in um, investigation. And then we have uh, Aaron Jennings, who is our cabin safety investigator. So if I need to know something about a Falcon 2000, um, I'm not gonna go to Dennis because he's helicopter driver and I'm not gonna go to Aaron because he's a cabin person. I'm gonna go to a Falcon 2000 person. If I need to know something about a G450, I'm gonna go find me a G450 person. In a company our size with uh, literally over 200 aircraft and 38 different makes, models and types, is there any one individual that can be an expert in all of those? No, there isn't, absolutely not. So um, even though we have expertise within the safety department, it takes all of us, literally all of you, to really make SMS work because all of us have our own little piece of the pot. Uh, I've worked in uh, the 121 world, the, the 135 world, the 91 world, the corporate world, the GA world, um, but am I an expert in every department? Am I an expert in flight dispatch? Am I an expert in maintenance? Even though I'm, I'm an AMP and an IA, do I know every single airplane that we have? No, I do not. So it literally takes everybody. And that's why I put that to the department level because every department in their own little world, they're the ones that have the expertise to bring to the table to reduce that risk to make sure nothing bad happens in the organization. So SMS is not one person. It is not the safety manager. It is not the VP of safety. It is not me. It is literally the whole organization. And it takes the whole organization to make this work. Uh, to an acceptable level as determined by management. Now you say, well, why determined by management? Um, they are the ones that have to take and provide the resources um, to make this work. 
they are the ones that have to decide where do you like to live in what I call the river of safety. So you have the river of safety. And uh, I use that analogy because the Ohio River is right in the back of me here. And on the banks of that river, you have literally bankruptcy. If you ignore and just not accept that there's risk involved, um, that's the fastest way to have an accident happen and literally put yourself out of business. But on the other hand, we don't have unlimited resources. And um, the only way to be 100% safe is, quite frankly, never fly. Well, we don't make money then. And that's really what we're in the business here. Your owners own their aircraft to be able to do their business, to make money, to support the aircraft, and quite frankly, give us all good jobs. So it has to be somewhere in the middle there. Um, straight down the middle, I, I consider the regulations. Um, if your company goes a little beyond the regulations or more down, you know, more add, do more stuff than the regulations call for. Like SMS, in the 135 and 91 world, SMS is not a requirement. The only place that 14 CFR, CFR chapter five applies to is 121 air carriers. So any 135 or 91 operator that is doing SMS is going beyond the regulations and living on that good side of the river is safety. Um, through a continuous process of hazard identification, uh, risk assessments, assessments of identified hazards. What does this really mean? It means that you have to be looking for the things that are gonna get you in trouble every day. Every individual in the organization has to want to find the things that are gonna get us in trouble and put us out of business tomorrow. And that does take all of us, okay? So hopefully that makes sense to you. So SMS, uh, according to our friends at ICAO, this is the ICAO definition of SMS, it is an international standard to guide aviation organizations in developing policy process and procedures that work as I put in, the way we look at it at EJM, at the department level, the departmental level, because that's where the expertise is, to proactively actively identify hazards and their associated risks through a continuous process of hazard identification uh, from operational data inputs, that's your risk assessments, that is your uh, FDM, FOCA data, that is your safety reporting, and proactive risk assessments, that is that, yes, we're going to go do a mission to um, a country that there is a lot of conflict in, uh, because the owner does work for the military, and the general stuff isn't working, and the general wants the owner there. And you're going to go into an area that has some hazards, Well, you need to proactively do risk assessments to identify how you're going to do that. Um, and then reduce those hazards and their associates risks to an acceptable level so that we can go do our mission safely, okay? So to me, the keys to SMS really is information has to come into the organization. We have to have safety reporting. Uh, we need to do flight data monitoring in FOQA. We need to investigate events when they happen. We need to document the findings. We need to communicate the findings out, and we have to take some action to reduce or eliminate uh, the hazards that we find. Okay. Does SMS happen overnight? It does not. Um, one of the big things, I, I have a lot of people that have come to me over the years and say, hey, um, we have this audit coming up with Wyvern, Argus, ACSF, and they're expecting us to have an SMS. Uh, can you help me get this thing together so we can have this audit ready in three months? And I said, no. I said, it is not a book. It is not a manual. It is a organizational way of thinking about managing and identifying risk. And that is something that does not happen overnight. Um, for an organization our size with over 200 aircraft and, and just under a thousand people, uh, in 2005, at that time, I was the chief inspector for our air carrier. And they came to me knowing I had a safety and accident investigation background and say, hey, this SMS thing is coming. Can you put this together for us? And I said, okay, I know a little bit about it. Let me go do some learning, uh, spend some time at MITRE and actually up in Canada, because in Canada, uh, some of the air carriers in Canada were actually embracing it 
right when the ICAO guidance came out that it was going to be uh, something that was going to be required of member nations. And um, when I got done with all that training, um, we actually had, I think it was a Argus audit coming up and the, uh, the manager, the senior manager, the, the president of the company and a couple of the VPs says, are you going to be ready for this thing? Are we going to have this thing up and running? And I said, no. And they said, why not? I said, it is not just buying a book. It is not just writing a manual. I said, this is an organizational way of thinking that we are going to have to change our entire way of thinking about how we fly, how we do maintenance, how we manage the risk of those things. And they said, well, is it really risk involved? I said, you know, we've never had any accidents. We've never had anything really bad happen to us in our history. I said, yeah, because we've been lucky. I said, there is risk there. There is risk every time we pull the airplane out of the hangar. And part of SMS is recognizing, identifying, and accepting that, that, that there is risk there. And so they said, well, how long is this going to take then? I said, it will take us a decade. It will take us 10 years. Um, they thought at that point they wasted a lot of money spending a year training me. And, uh, but if you look at the history of, of our SMS program, um, so we did our initial manager training and published our first SMM in, two, SMM in 2007. We're currently at revision 29. Um, 2008, we started doing a general employee population training. 2009, we uh, contracted with University of Southern California. They have a large safety and security program. Um, we actually started bringing them to Cincinnati and doing on-site classes for anyone that was a supervisor or above. And um, we've had 56 people graduate from that full safety and security program within our organization. Um, 2010, we joined the FAA SMS pilot program to help write 14 CFR Chapter 5. Uh, we did our level one validation. At that time, there was four levels of SMS. We did our level one validation. 2011, we also joined ASAP, or Aviation Safety Action Program, with the FAA. Uh, did our level two validation for SMS in 12. Implemented our flight data monitoring, our FOCO program in 2012 got our level three validation. And at that point, the uh, pilot program went away and we have what is now called the SMS voluntary program. Uh, 2014, got our active participant letter, 16 active conformance letter. And then in 17, we got our active conformance letter uh, stating that we were in full compliance with the ICAO SMM as written in now what is 14 CFR chapter five. Uh, if you look at that timeline, uh, my conversation then was in 2007. We finally got there in 2017, 10 years. It, it is not an overnight process. Um, it, it varies from organization to organization. If you're a small organization with a couple aircraft, um, you know, probably a year and a half, two years. Uh, if you're a large, large, large organization like us, it really does take a decade to do this and do it right. It is not because it is hard, it is because it is a total shift in the way that we think about managing risk within our organization. It goes from thinking, yes, we're the best thing from sliced bread because we never had anything happen, to thinking that the, our first accident happened five minutes ago, we just haven't found out about it yet. And what are we going to do to make sure that doesn't happen five minutes ago? And so it's, it, it is a different thinking, a way of thinking that we as an organization, we are vulnerable to having something really bad happen. And uh, it is up to all of us in the organization, every department, every person in that department that has the expertise to make sure that we never get there. Uh, so it is a fundamental different way of thinking about safety and about risk management. Okay. All right. So as a, as a safety insurance director, what I like to do is uh, show some examples of stuff that we had learned. Uh, so this is part of my presentation from the Flight Safety Foundation in Denver, Bass in Denver. And this was some lessons learned. So this is lesson one that, you know what? We all make mistakes. 
Um, it doesn't have to be something that we do in our organization as a pilot mechanic, controller, VP, that makes us have a bad day. Uh, it could be some external source. It could be someone that worked on our airplane and an MRO at a maintenance base that did something wrong. Now, now, as we as a crew and an organization have to deal with that mistake. Uh, it could be a controller who got a couple words, an altitude and a heading transposed in his mind and started to send one of our aircraft into the mountains. Uh, and that's what happened here. Um, so this came in as an ASAP report. As you see, I have uh, up here used with permission, a uh, reporter's permission. Um, so I actually reached out to the reporter and I said, you know what, this is a very good teaching tool as to why um, it is not just the people flying the airplane that can make a mistake that causes us to have a bad day. It could be someone external. Um, so I uh, got permission to use this. Uh, so let me explain this to you. I'll set this up before I play it. Um, so we had an aircraft. This is our aircraft here, EGM-399. The aircraft is where the little F is, and that's the little breadcrumb trails where the airplane is going. Uh, they're at 9,000 feet, 240 knots. Uh, they're doing the LDA, the offset localizer approach in runway 35 in the Salt Lake City. And as you know, around Salt Lake City, what do we have? We have mountains. Um, in, uh, for those mountains, this is the actual controller's radar screen. This is what he has in front of him. And this is uh, audio and video that we were able to get through our ASAP ERC from the FAA. And right here, these numbers, this 900, this 90, which represents 9,000, this 8,0, which represents 8,000, that is the minimum obstacle clearance altitudes for those sectors. Um, in mountainous terrain, the highest obstacle then in this sector would be at 6,000 feet. You have a 2,000 foot clearance in mountainous terrain, a 1,000 foot clearance in non-mountainous terrain. So right now, our aircraft is at 9,000 feet. They're in a sector they're supposed to be at 9,000 feet. And so let me go ahead and play this for you and let me um, see who can find the errors. Okay, so let me go ahead and play this. Jet 399, center maintain 6,000. 6,000, that's 399. So if you didn't hear, he just instructed our airplane to go to 6,000 feet in a sector that 8,000 is the lowest allowed. You will see here in a little bit a red LA up top here. That is a low altitude warning that the center computers. Jet speed 399, flighting 010, intercept runway 35, localizer. 010, intercept 35, localizer, jet speed 399. Now, this is early morning. It is dark out. They are in IMC. They're in the clouds here. They are now at 8,000 feet. Now at 7,900 feet. So they are now below the minimum um, altitude. Now listen to controller when he comes on again here. Chesapeake 399, you're five miles from ZPOG, cross ZPOG at 8,000, and uh, cleared LDA DME runway 35 approach. Chesapeake 399, you gave us the send six. You want us to cross ZPOG at six? And we'll have to, we'll have to. 399, check the altitude immediately. The MBA is 8,000. Climb the and maintain 8,000 immediately. Climbing 8,000, just the 399. And to confirm, you're given us to send 6,000. Let's see, just the 399. I gave you, I'm pretty sure I gave you 8,000, just the 399. Go All righty, so. Um, Just be 399, you're three miles from ZPOG, cross ZPOG at 8,000. Cleared LDA DME, only 35 approach. ZPOG 8,000, cleared LDA DME, uh, 35, set speed 399. All righty. Um, 
So here we actually have a controller error. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that I try to express to people when, the, when your passengers get on your airplane, they are having blind trust in you that you are going to do what you're supposed to do correctly so they get there safely. Uh, when me as a maintenance technician works on your airplane and you get on it, you as the crew and the passenger have blind trust in me that I'm going to do what I was supposed to do so that uh, everybody gets there safely. And the same thing with controllers. Um, we as pilots have um, confidence in controllers that they know what they're doing. But you know what? On occasion, even the controllers make errors. Um, in this case, this aircraft was IMC. It was very early morning. It was still dark out. Um, and the crews... Unfortunately, uh, the, unfortunately, the controller made an error. The crew was following it. And uh, fortunately, the center computers, um, you saw the red LA, that was computers telling the controller, hey, what are you doing? And the fact that the crew caught that the uh, controller said, hey, I want you to cross z at eight after I just told you to go to six. So, um, so lesson here is it doesn't have to be something that you do that you do that can get you in trouble today. It could be something a maintenance tech did at a repair station. Uh, it could be a controller that accidentally transposed an altitude and a heading. And that's, that's what happened here, okay? So lesson number one. Um, lesson number two, we don't always know what's ahead. Um, so I'm gonna take and read this to you real quick on arrival to Teterboro. So, uh, this is a crew uh, doing arrival into Teterboro on the Wilkes Bar 4 um, arrival. Uh, this is part of their narrative. So on arrival to Teterboro on the Wilkes Bar 4 star and about two minutes prior to reaching Muggsy at 6,000 feet, 250 knots, we overheard a G5 preceding us on this arrival transmit to Tracon that we just came very, very close to a glider at Muggsy at 6,000 feet. As we approached Muggsy, the pilot flying pointed out a glider at our 11 o'clock at same altitude. I also spotted the aircraft white low wing and probably single seat in the right hand orbit. To pass behind it, we passed behind it. Passing Muggsy, we're given a normal radar vector to the east towards uh, Teterboro runway 19 final. I acknowledged this vector and reported a glider encounter. A few seconds later, I noticed another glider to our right about the same horizontal distance and about a thousand feet below us. We passed this aircraft north of its position. I also reported this aircraft to a very busy controller who responded with, we cannot see them. Evasion action was not required. We then continued to the approach and landed at Teterboro. Both the pilot flying and I have been flying into Teterboro for 20 to 30 years. The pilot flying was even based there for a few years. We both agreed that we were totally unaware of glider ops in this area. We also both agreed that had we been given the same vector 10 to 15 seconds earlier, the outcome of this event may have been very different. So if we look at the Wilkes Bar for arrival and we look at a VFR sectional chart. Now, um, I know we all use probably a lot of this uh, Jefferson flight deck, so there is VFR stuff there, but typically um, if you're flying IFR, you're not rever referring to VFR sectional charts. And I doubt very much of glider pilots are walking around with SIDS and STARS and approach fleets. Um, when the aircrafts landed, the two aircrafts that were involved in this, they ended up at the same FBO and they started talking to each other. And then they started talking to one of the local pilots and one of the local pilots said, yeah, hey, right down below um, Muggsy there, there are two big glider ports, which you can see here on the VFR sectional charts. And um, so one of the pilots, one of our pilots decided to contact uh, one of the glider clubs down there, actually went down there and started talking to them. And they found out when they go up here to the north, up in the Poconos, when they come back, there's this little sweet spot between this VOR intersection and this VOR intersection right here that they like to orbit at 6,000 feet. Well, guess what that intersection is? That is Muggsy. The other issue is when the, um, the pilot talked to actually ATC, they found out because the gliders have very high aspect ratio wings and they are not positive control traffic, they make weird little radar blips on the controller screens and they like to turn the gain down and make them disappear. 
Now, gliders are not required to have transponders. If they do have them, they are supposed to be on, but there is no regulation that says they have to. Um, so the perfect setup, they like to orbit right here, which our crew spotted and uh, came very close to having a midair with a glider. Um, right here at 6,000 feet at this intersection, which just happens to be where we are supposed to cross at 6,000 right here. The perfect setup. Um, this came in as an ASAP report. Um, and I just happened to review it before I went home the evening that this came in. And I contacted the crew, that the crew member that filed it. And I said, you know what, I need to file a crew communication letter, put this out like tomorrow. And uh, in our dispatch paperwork, we need to put something in there that warn the crew that um, there's glider operations down there. Now, I have presented this at many, many conferences. And uh, the last one, like I said, I presented at was at the Flight Safety Foundation Conference. Uh, I've also presented this at uh, the FAA InfoShare. At about 400 participants at the FAA, or I'm sorry, at the Flight Safety Foundation Conference in Denver, when I asked people to raise their hands that were aware of gladder operations right below Muggsy, um, I had about four people raise their hand. My point here is with presenting this is this one safety report, uh, we sent this out to all of our crews the very next morning. Uh, about 600 crew members. I sent this to my counterparts at NetJets, NetJets Europe, and quite frankly, about six other 135 carriers I knew. And so this one safety report um, went out probably to multiple thousands of pilots the very next day. This happened in 2013. I did the pre presentation at Flight Safety Foundation in Denver in 2019. To this day, it is still educating people. I cannot stress to you how important your safety report is. Um, because this is the thing that makes people aware of. So right now, so added information to our crew briefing sheets for T-to-world departure and arrivals, indicating a lot of the glider op operations, five nautical miles southwest of Muggsy. So to this day, uh, six, seven, seven years later, eight years later, it is still teaching people. Um, so uh, do Q and, during Q&A, I may ask how many people were aware of this and how many people weren't, okay? Um, there we go. Why is this important? Well, it could stop this. This is a glider Hawker 800 midair. This is actually the spar of a glider right here that went just underneath the windshield of this airplane. Um, this happened in Carson City, Nevada. The glider was operating under 91205. It wasn't required to have a mode C transponder. Um, in this case, it did have one installed, but unfortunately the glider pilot elected to leave it off to save battery power for the radios, which was a regulatory violation. Um, everybody was lucky that day. Uh, the, as you can see from here, the instrument panel was shoved into the uh, pilot's lap. She was injured very badly. Um, leading edge of the right wing was gone. The inboard part of it was gone. This engine was actually fought it and had to be shut down. As you see, they had to land the airplane on the uh, skid plate of the belly uh, because the hydraulics uh, were leaking all over the place. They could not get the gear down and radon was gone. And um, literally the skill of the crew saved this airplane and the passengers that were on board. Um, the glider pilot, just so you know, actually had a parachute on and even with one wing gone because there's a spar of the wing, uh, was able to parachute out and actually a sheriff picked him up walking down the road about, I think it was about four or five hours later and uh, didn't have a scratch on it. Think about it. Your one safety report, what you happen to you today or the next time you fly that you share could literally stop this from happening. I, as a safety professional, 
or any safety person in a safety department. Can we do that? No, we can't. We're not out there doing the job every day. You're the ones out there flying today. The mechanics are the one out there working on the airplanes every day. You're the ones that have the knowledge to keep something like this from happening. Uh, I, as a safety person, I am just a conduit. I'm just the collector of information and figuring out how can we best take what we have learned from you today and get it out to everybody else uh, to keep something like this from happening to them in the future. So you are the key to SMS. It is no one single person. It is not the safety person. It is literally all of you that make this work. And this is a classic example of, of how that is. Okay. All right. Um, I talk about risk. So risk is literally everywhere. Um, we have human error, just like our controller, he transposed a heading and an altitude. You have risk behavior. This is what I like to call organizational risk. This is where, yeah, we know as an organization, something isn't exactly right, uh, but nothing's happened today. Nothing happens in the past. So yeah, we'll just keep doing that way, even though we really kind of know it's wrong. Um, and that's something the organization has to fix. And then we have reckless behavior. This is unfortunately where people put themselves, their passengers and the organization at risk. Um, this is an example of that. This is an actual picture that I actually took here. And um, since we're having a kind of a one-way conversation, let me just kind of set this up for you. So obviously you see this nice big step ladder sitting on two tables uh, down in the middle of Florida. Uh, you have an individual maintenance tech up on top here with no safety equipment on, no harness. And I guarantee you, if he were to fall from that height and hit that concrete floor, he would probably die. That is one bad thing. The other really, really, really bad thing is this person right here, that is their vice president and director of maintenance. He is the one that is responsible for this individual. Now, I walked into the hangar. I just happened to have my little digital camera on me. And when I saw that, I, you know what? I got to take a picture of that. After I took the picture, I went over to this guy and I said, hey, can we get this guy down? Uh, this is an airplane I was responsible for. And I said, you know, if he falls from there, they may hold us reliable. And I said, can we get him down from there? And so I went over and held part of the ladder. He held part of the ladder. We got the guy down. And after we got him down, I said, hey, let's go talk. So him and I went outside the garage door here, went over there. And I looked at him and I said, you really want to go to jail today, don't you? And he looked at me like I was kind of really weird. And I said, under OSHA regulations, you as the VP and his boss, that is called willful negligence. If he falls from there and dies, they can jail you. I said, the second thing is going to happen is this picture I just took, and I showed him my nice little digital picture. I said, I'm going to give that to, the, to this guy's family, and they're going to sue your organization out of business. Things like this puts companies out of business. He falls, he dies, family sues. They don't have a company anymore. My point in this is that human error happens. And we have to learn from that. The at-risk behavior is something that the organization itself has to fix when they identify it. But this here, this reckless behavior, things like this should never be acceptable to any of us because this does put people's lives at risk. And literally it puts our organization at risk. This kind of things can put organizations out of business. And if your organization goes out of business, guess what? You don't get your paycheck tomorrow. So this literally affects all of us and should never be acceptable, okay? All right. So um, lesson 3.1, what we had yesterday may not be what we have today. So I'm gonna show you a little skit. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. Um, so uh, please excuse the fact if you've seen it before, um, but I, I do like it because it's kind of a variation on, on the original. So I will play it here for you. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball.
The correct answer is 16 passes. So, um, for those of you who have seen this before, yes, there was a gorilla that walked in there. Uh, for those of you who have not seen this before, some of you probably saw the gorilla, some probably of you did not see the gorilla. Now, for my folks who saw the gorilla and who have seen this before, I'm going to continue playing this because there's another part of it, uh, even if you have seen this before, that might be a little different. And uh, there's a little point out. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. <laughs> Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. So my point here is, just because we've shot this same approach the same way a thousand times, do we still have to review the approach plate? Yes. Just because a maintenance tech has changed the same part on this airplane 50 times in the last 10 years, does it mean that the instructions have changed because they made a modification to the part today? It could have. Just because um, we've done something over and over again doesn't mean that is the way we do it today. Things do change. Policy process and procedures do change, approach plates change, maintenance instructions change. Um, this little guy, my little friend, the monkey here, he is always just waiting there to get you. This is why we have two people in a cockpit of an airplane, isn't it? This reason why you have our double eye inspections, where we have someone else go look at the work I just finished because I could have made an error. I could have got distracted, okay? Um, good book. You can get this. Um, this is experiments done by, at, by a bunch of research at the University of Illinois in Urbana. Uh, you can get this for your e-reader for, I think, for a couple bucks from Amazon. It is a very short, very good read. My point is this is just because we have done something the same way forever, just because we think we are so sure that we know how to do it. Well, today something changed. Now that is one of the factors that add up to the three or four factors that lead us into an accident. So um, please always check everything. Lesson 343, who are the best teachers? Well, I hope I convinced you that you are. Um, because today you may have learned something from what you did when you were out flying today from an encounter with ATC, with an encounter uh, of your maintenance tech. You are the best teachers we have. Um, so you, you need to teach us. You need to teach us safety professionals so we can help teach the organization. And the way we do that at EJM is through um, our ASAP program and our mandatory reporting items, our crew communication letters, our weekly crew communication email that our director of operations sends out, and our safety newsletter we publish a number of times a year. Having safety reports come in, unless you do something with them, are really useless. Because we, we take our best teachers, you, and we don't do you a service if we don't get that information out. So as I had in the slide, SMS works by information coming in. It gets crunched up. We learn something from it, and we get it back out to the people that need it every day. Right. So say to reporting. Uh, safety performance indicators, if any of you have had audits, Argus, Wyvern, and all that, they have safety performance indicator. That is part of SMS. Safety reporting is one of our safety performance indicators. Uh, our target is 36 reports per 10,000 departures. Right now, we're sitting at 116 per 10,000 departures. So that means it is steady. It's in the blue. If it was improving, say it was below 36 and it was going up, it would be a green block and um, it was degrading to be yellow, okay? So we actually have safety reporting as a safety performance indicator. Some people would argue with me a long time ago, well, if we're getting a lot of safety reports, that means we're doing something bad. 
Well, no, that means that people are willing to share their experiences of things that are really happening out there every day. Trust me, there are things happening out there. And most of the time they do not get reported. So that's why we had to develop a culture of safety reporting so that in fact, we as an organization learn what really goes on. Okay. All right. So FOQA, flight data monitoring. Again, one of those FAA things that uh, even though in uh, Europe under EASA and uh, ICAO, it is a required um, program for commercial operations and they do consider commercial operations or 135 being commercial operations in Europe. Here in the US, they do not. And um, unfortunately, I think it's unfortunately, um, FOCO and flight data manage, uh, monitoring is not a required thing in the US for 135, actually even for 121 operators. Uh, it is strictly voluntary. Um, at EGM, we elected to do it for a couple of reasons. Number one, it is the right thing to do. Number two, to be able to gain airspace permit in Europe, um, any aircraft over 27,000 kilos, we have to have in the flight data monitoring program. So right now we currently have 73 of our aircraft in that program. Uh, we hope to have all of our 135 aircraft, a balance of those in 2021. Now, why have this? So I'm gonna talk about two specific things real quick, um, which we have as safety performance indicators because we have seen things that uh, possibly could be an issue. Uh, so Global Expresses, uh, those airplanes, they don't like to quit flying. Uh, you bring them over the runway, they get into ground effect, and uh, unless you land that aircraft pretty much like a Learjet where you fly it onto runway, it will just keep going down the runway 10 feet off the ground for the next 2,000 feet. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of that. So in our flight data monitoring, we look for the precursors of that happening. Uh, flight control pre-departure checks. So after Bedford, um, the G4 accident, the un unfortunate accident in Bedford, uh, one of our owners actually went to uh, our owner services people and uh, their owner services VP and said, how do you know as EGM, my management company, that my crew is doing control checks every single time they fly the airplane. And honestly, he said, we don't know. It is in the checklist, it's in our SOPs, but if you want me to say definitively that they are doing it, I can't tell you. And uh, so they came to me and they, and they said, is there a way for us to do this? Uh, so I happen to be over in uh, Europe uh, to south of London, the company that makes the software we do for our flight data monitoring is called Aerobytes. And uh, I was doing some recurrent training there. I was there for a week doing some recurrent training on the software. And I said to the instructor, can we write a script that shows me if the crews do pre-departure control, pre control checks? And we actually sat down in class and wrote it. And uh, so the way we set this up, and it's really interesting, is from the time, and if you look right here, it says engine starting control checks. From the time the engine, the first engine that is started, as soon as the um, flight data recorder uh, registers oil pressure on the engine, it starts this script to look for these flight control checks, and that's them right here. And um, this is this little automation of it. Um, so this is Aerobytes, the software I'm using. This is looking at the graphical display of it, and this is the visual display of it. And I'll just play this for you real quick. There's no audio. And you'll see the elevators here, and you'll see the ailerons and spoilers here. And this is a control column um, up at the, uh, the flight deck. And you can see all this movement. Here's the rudder and the rudder pedals. And um, so we were able to go back and uh, actually install this script into our software. And we actually went back and ran about 23,000 flights. And uh, what happens is if we see the full control checks all the way to the stops, the, uh, it'll be cyan here. If they were not all the way to the stops, it will take and turn yellow. And if they were not done at all, or like only 5% done, this will actually turn red. 
And so when I review this data, I can actually see that this was done. And this all out came out of a request from an owner, one of our owners to say, how do you really know? Um, so uh, we went back, ran our 23,000 or so flights. Uh, did we find a couple aircraft that may mean we're not doing them all the time? We actually did. And um, it was usually a block where there's a block of flights of three or four flights in a row, uh, very short ones. They would do a, a drop and run. And um, it, it, just, it just wasn't happening. And uh, quite frankly, the crews could not believe it. They said, no, that could not happen. We could not do that. And I actually put a presentation like this together with their data and presented it to them. And um, they very quietly said, thank you. And uh, it has never happened again. Um, so this is a, a, a very, very good program. FDM is something that I um, think is very useful. Um, now, is it something though that uh, is just for the crew? I'm gonna show you here that it is not. Okay, so this is the uh, Global Express one wingtip strike. And uh, so these are some formulas and I'm not gonna get crazy into them that uh, looks at uh, roll and pitch and speed and where the airplane is um, at takeoff and its height um, radio altimeter above the runway and that and angles and that and the computer does its thing to tell me if in fact we are coming close to having a wingtip strike. And uh, so this is one, uh, we didn't get a wingtip strike on this one, but it got very close. And I'm, so I'll run this for you. Uh, this is landing Teterboro, so 6,000 foot runway. And uh, I'll kind of walk you through it here. Uh, again, no audio, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. So over the threshold here, here's the touchdown markers. And as you can see, the nose comes up a little bit, just a bit, and the airplane just keeps on floating and floating. And we have a wing drop a little bit and it's rocking a little bit. And uh, here we finally get touched down. Uh, this aircraft likes to keep flying. Um, and this is a Google Earth map. So no, there is not a real airplane down here at the end. Um, that's just from the imagery. So what happened here? So as you can see, um, they started to uh, bring the nose up just slightly right here. And then at that point, the aircraft continued to float, where my curse, uh, mouse go, all the way down to where the main gear is contacted here, 2,800 foot down a 6,000 foot runway. So we had 3,100 feet remaining. Uh, TR is deployed here, past 50%. Uh, first break happened at 3,500 feet, nose wheel finally touched down, and uh, at 400 feet remaining, we're still at 30 knots. Um, we have put special training together for our global pilots um, to make them aware of just the characteristics of this particular airplane. And uh, But this is one of the things that we monitor with our flight data program to make sure the crews are not getting in trouble with this aircraft. Okay. Now, is it just the crews that we look at? No, it is not. It is actually ourselves too. Uh, this is one of those. This was a deployment of, of an SOP that we did not have. And this had to do with night visual approaches. So um, this is going into Jackson Hole. You got again, mountains around here. And uh, out of our flight data, uh, we noticed, I noticed this flight. I am one of the gatekeepers and one of the uh, people that do the analysis. And uh, this is a G4, G450. And uh, they were doing a night visual approach. And as you see, they came around, uh, they had to stay high. And they were cutting in way in before the initial approach fix, which would be out here if you're flying an actual uh, ILS approach. And to actually get rid of the altitude, as you see here, what were they doing? They were doing S-turns. Now, S-turns are something I do with my 172 or my 182. It's not something I think is a good to do, or I hope you, you would agree, is not to do with a golf stream. 
uh, especially at night, especially in mountains. Um, when we talked to the crew and when I looked at our GOM to say, is there anything that says that we could do this? There isn't. There was actually actually nothing in our GOM that says you could not do this. Even though it's probably not a good practice, but we had nothing in our GOM that says you should not do this thing. So we actually added to our GOM only request visual approaches at night to runways that have an instrument approach and fly the instrument approach profile. The crews were not breaking any regulation. They were not breaking any SOPs that we had in our manual. But was this a good practice for us to allow one of our aircraft to do? No, it was not. So it was us to us as the operator to take and put a mitigation in place to keep this from happening. What I'm saying is with FDM, it is just not looking at the crews, how they fly the airplane. It is looking at how is flight safety or our training provider, if you use semi flight or flight safety or another training provider, how are they training our crews? Do we have someone there that is training them to something they've been doing or they did as a pilot years ago or as a maintenance technician years ago that we really don't want them to do? Well, this is a way to find out that, yeah, the training isn't being done how exactly we want it. Uh, is there something in our GOM that says you could or could not do something like this? That is the actual us looking at the company with the FDM data, okay? So it's just not the crews that we look at when we look at FDM data. We look at the company itself, our policy process and procedures on how we are permitting the aircraft to be flown. We are looking at our training providers. How are they training our crews? Um, so it, it is just not something that is strictly for looking at the crew flying the airplane. Okay. So FOQA data, though, one of the things that I, I try to stress is first, don't believe the data. Um, there are many sources of error in FOQA data. It could be a, an error in the FDR system. It could be a programming error. It could be bad data. It could be poor quality data. Uh, it could be weather conditions that is messed with one probe and not the other. Uh, FDM data has to be used with caution. Um, only people that are trained in FDM data analysis should interpret FDM data because you can end up accusing the crew of an event that actually never happened. Okay. Um, so I, I caution people, if you go into an FDM program and you get your FDM provider to send you reports, if you're not looking at the data yourself, you're just looking at the report. If you see something bad, do not assume that it, that it is true. You want to go and question that data. You want to run it to ground before you go to a crew member and say, you know what, you really did this wrong. And he looks at you and you say, what are you talking about? Um, so FDM data has to be used with caution, all right? Um, I'm gonna show you an example here. So this was an approach going into an airport. And as you see, I've got all kinds of cautions. So this is that red. So we had in this case, unstable approach, high rate of descent, high sink rate. We had a GTBWS going off for sink rate. We had high airspeed going off. And it looks like, um, you know, the 420, 462 feet AGL right here, uh, 500 feet uh, MSL, uh, 148 knots, they got 122 selected. So it looks like, you know, if you're using 500 feet for your stable critique, uh, they're far from stable at 500 feet here. Now, I look at the trace data and yep, it's all over the place. I got the same warnings. So I'm saying, yep, yeah, there's something really going on here. Then I look at the ILS approach profile. And I look at this and I say, what the heck is this? What, I mean, did the wind blow them off? And then I start looking at, okay, where the heck were they? Where were they landing? And I see up here, Oh, DCA runaway 19. Guess what? They were flying the approach profile. 
that little joggle in the data that triggered all the events, guess what? They were avoiding getting a missile shot at them. They were doing the approach into DCA, down the Potomac, avoiding the White House, avoiding all the monuments, and this was a normal approach. The FDM data is not smart enough. The programming is not smart enough yet. We haven't built artificial intelligence into it yet to know that the crew is doing exactly what they are supposed to be doing. Even though the software tells us, nope, this was an unstable approach to the max. Okay, This is why I cautioned you. Uh, if you go into an FDM program, please, please make sure you get proper training, the gatekeeper gets proper training, the people that are gonna take and do the analysis get proper training on how to interpret FDM data. Um, two of the big sources for that is Cranfield University in the UK. Uh, they have a very, very good flight data monitoring and uh, FOCA commercial and aviation program. Uh, I actually went to this, out of the 40 hours of this program that I spent, we spent a solid 20% to 25% learning how data can be wrong, learning how data can mislead you to think something happened when it did not, okay? Um, USC, they just started a program, I uh, actually helped develop for them. Um, and so they also have a program there. One of the other good sources, uh, International Side Air Safety Investigator, I am an IOSI member, uh, full member, and uh, that is another one of the good sources for uh, training to learn this stuff on how to do investigation, on how to uh, investigate safety reports, and how to do FOCO and FDM data analysis, okay? All righty, so safety reporting, ASAP reporting, we try to make it easy for people to actually do safety reporting. Um, on the back of all of our badges, uh, there is this actual little QR code. And uh, for my folks on the phone here, if you actually take your iPhone and turn the camera on, and you actually scan that right on your monitor, like I just did mine, and um, it will actually take you to our safety reporting website. And there you go. Okay. We try to make it easy. Um, we do have an ASAP program, so it is an approved safety reporting program. And um, so it does um, give um, some benefits to the flight crew. Um, so for us, um, our pilots, flight attendants, mechanics, and our flight followers that hold dispatcher certificates and our ground technicians are part of our ASAP program. So with an ASAP program, if you're not familiar with it, it is a, an agreement through a memorandum of understanding, an MOU between the operator and the FAA. And it basically says, yes, if a certificated person files an ASAP report, let's say we have an altitude deviation, that is our fault, we missed an altitude. Um, or we had a mechanic that worked on an airplane and he forgot to put a cotter pin in a bolt. And it is our error. If you filed an ASAP report and it did not involve one of the five disqualifiers, so there are five disqualifiers. That is, if drugs were involved or alcohol was involved or intentional falsification of records or uh, intentional disregard for safety or substance abuse, which substance abuse is you went to the dentist, he prescribed a drug for you to numb the pain and you're supposed to take one every four hours and you're taking one every hour and you get pulled on a drug screen and it shows that you have four times the amount in your system, that is substance abuse. As long as it does not meet one of these disqualifiers, um, there is no jeopardy against your certificate period. Um, that was a big change when chapter five was approved uh, the SMS 14 CFR chapter five, that is one of the big changes that happened with, S with ASAP is they went from being able to do um, administrative actions or just a letter of reprimand to actually no action whatsoever. So it is strictly now up to what we call the event review committee 
that is a member of your pilot group, a member of um, the company group, and an FAA representative from your FISDO, it is strictly up to them to accept a report or not to accept a report. I will tell you out of uh, about 12 years now, let's see, not 12 years, about eight years now that we've had our program and well over 1,200 reports, there are only two that we have not accepted. And they were actually for um, intentional disregard for safety. And um, so it is very, very seldom um, that that would occur. So ASAP reporting is a very, very good thing. It is a good thing for the organization and it's a good thing for the certificate holders, okay? All right, so um, the AC, I'll go back one. This is the AC, 12066C. Uh, it This was revised last year. And um, so you can work with your FISO to start your own internal ASAP program. If you do not have the resources to do that, our friends at the Air Charter Safety Foundation, uh, my friend Russ Lawton, they have an ASAP program for small, op small operators, one airplane, two pilots, that can become part of their ASAP program and participate and be afforded the same benefits of ASAP, okay? All right. So um, that is my story. Um, so I will take and uh, let me close this up and we will open it up for, uh, for questions. See if I can make technology work here too. All right, there we go. Fred, as we're waiting for questions to come in, I'm going to say thank you, and that was an outstanding presentation. I don't know if you saw one of the uh, guests did put a comment in there regarding the the glider operations and said he'd been flying in that area for many many years and was unaware of that. So that was a, a great thing to see. Well, and that's the reason that safety reporting is so important because guess what. That person just learned something today that can keep something bad from them happening. So to that person, pass it on to everybody you know. <laughs> <laughs> we will have, uh, you know, the, the uh, presentation was recorded, so it'll go on the Gieselball website. So okay. members that were not able to attend live will we'll be able to see that going forward. So, All righty. And uh, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to ask me the questions there because I think you can see them better coming up. Okay. Okay. Well, you must have covered every base because we're not getting any questions coming. Okay. <laughs> Fred's pretty good at that. If anybody has any questions that pop up over the weekend or as you're going through uh, your week next week and thinking about integrating any of this, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm listed on the Gieselbaugh directory or Tim knows how to get a hold of me as well. And I'll be more than happy to connect you with Fred. He'll answer any and all questions you might have. And, uh, Hopefully this helps everybody take a step forward of being uh, safer and more constant professionals that we all already are. Uh, so thanks everybody for your time. Oh, looks like we got one question. Yeah. Uh, here's a question, Fred. What do you do to protect from punitive use of data? Okay, so um, both for, so <laughs> one of the things I encourage people to do both with ASAP for safety reporting and if you're going to do flight data monitoring, get your program approved by the FAA under the AC. Um, an approved FAA um, ASAP program and an approved FAA FOCA program under federal law prohibits the disclosure of that information. And it prohibits the FAA for using it for uh, punitive action against the pilot and for ASAP, or I'm sorry, for FOCA data, actually against the operator. For us, the only data um, that the ERC sees out of ASAP is de-identified data. So the ERC members that vote on to accept the report, that vote on any type of information that we need to put out, they only see de-identified data because who it was, it doesn't matter. We are trying to learn from the event. Now, me as the gatekeeper for ASAP, if I see someone filing an ASAP report every week for the same thing, as a gatekeeper that, that sees the identified data, am I probably gonna have a discussion with them? Yeah, I probably am, okay? Um, FOCA data, again, I'm, I'm the gatekeeper for that. Um, once I get the data, uh, my Aerobyte server, 
actually lives in Lisbon, Portugal. And the privacy laws in Lisbon are a lot tougher than they are here in the US. So once I get the data, the first thing I do is I upload it to my server in Lisbon and it is off US soil. Uh, so I have also now I have federal laws protecting the data from being used. And I also have it off, off site. Um, once I've transferred the data to our server in Lisbon, I actually get rid of it from here in the US. And um, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I've, I've ran animations and I even had one of our past presidents, a couple of presidents past say, I want to know who that is. And I said, I'm sorry, I cannot tell you. He says, well, you're going to. I said, no, I am not. I said, number one, it's, it's a violation of federal law for me as a gatekeeper to tell you. I said, I can actually be prosecuted for doing that. So there, there are protections. Um, if, if you do not have a approved program for ASAP and for SMS, can, that, can anyone use that data? Yeah, they can. So you, you do want to encourage uh, your operators to get your programs approved for that. Okay. Uh, Fred, we've got a question from Gary here asking, how do we get people to buy into SMS? Unfortunately, many simply don't get it. That is correct. And that is one reason that it takes time. Um, when, when I told our company, that it was going to take 10 years, they thought I was out of my mind. I mean, they literally just thought, I just, we just wasted a year of sending you to school and you being out of the office to learn this stuff. When we started actually doing it, um, they started to realize that, yeah, there are some benefits to this. Um, one of the big things that we did with our repair station is we joined the OSHA VPP program, the Voluntary Protection Program, as part of our SMS. And we were able to go self-insured. And by doing that, those, uh, for us, it was about $30,000 a quarter that we sent the state of Ohio for, for workman's compensation. We, had, we were able to stop doing that. We became self-insured. We didn't have to send the state money anymore. Um, so there are, there are benefits to it. There are benefits from a marketing standpoint too, to be very honest with you. Um, from an audit standpoint, there are benefits to it. Um, does everybody buy into it? No. If you ask me, do I have 100% of the people at EGM drinking the SMS Kool-Aid? I'll tell you, I probably got 97 to 98%. Do I have 100%? No. No. I mean, that's just reality. 100% of the people aren't going to do it. Um, but just like this, um, and the reason I do the pres presentations at Flight Safety, the one I use, the Teterboro one, is that the knowledge you gain from SMS literally can save your company. The, the, the report you get from the guy standing on the ladder, that if he falls and dies and those people sue your company and put you out of business, I mean, imagine quite simply, and this is, and this is the reason I, I actually use that, that in um, INDOC, doing SMS INDOC when I teach it every week. Does one person have the right to jeopardize the livelihoods of a thousand people in EJM? They don't. But when something like that happens, that's what's happening. So to be able to use SMS as a way to mitigate those type of risk and make sure they don't happen and make sure you have the right equipment if you're working on an aircraft, you have the safety harnesses, you have the right ladders, you've taught your people, don't put the ladder on a table. That is all risk management. That is all risk mitigation, to literally to keep you out of, from going out of business and for all your employees to keep getting their paychecks. So if you can sell it to them that, hey, this protects you, this protects your livelihood, that's a big driver to me. So hopefully I answer your question there. Yeah, Fred, I think you did great. All right. Absolutely. Okay. Tim, do you see any other questions in the queue? 
I do not. And uh, to your point, Patrick, for the folks that are still on the line, if you have questions going forward, uh, you can still reach out to any of us. Uh, there is a question, uh, by the way, thanks to Teterboro Glider Info. Is there a result I know about that when I go into Teterboro? So that's wonderful. Okay. Uh, Patrick, what I'll do, I will send you a copy of that crew communication letter. Uh, I have I have passed that out all over the country, so it's all over. I'll send you a copy, and if you want to distribute it to your members, please do it. Yeah, in fact, Tim, uh, why don't we find a way to maybe host that on the Gieselbaugh website to drive everybody there to a common location, and uh, then people can access it as they need to. Yeah, I think we can, we'll can. we do a couple of things. Uh, we'll, we'll put it on the website. We also put out a monthly newsletter. We'll include that in the newsletter. That, uh, okay. Sometimes okay. I'll send that to you here after the meeting. Perfect. That's fantastic. Perfect. Great. What an outstanding presentation, timely as can be, and uh, really, really appreciate you guys taking the time to do this with us. You're very welcome. You. Everybody have a great weekend. Thanks for your time. I hope we get to see you two at the golf tournament in May. You hey, will. There you go. All right, Thank folks. You. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. You Take too. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.